Hello students, welcome to EPG Part Shala. I am Dr. Zina Iqbal from Department of Pharmaceutics, Faculty of Pharmacy, Jamia Hamdard. Today we are going to talk on the module Parental Control Drug Delivery Systems under which we would be highlighting the injectable drug delivery devices and this is from the paper Novel Drug Delivery Systems Part 1. The learning objectives of this particular module would revolve around first introducing what is parental control drug delivery system very very briefly. Then we would be highlighting the parental control drug delivery devices, its types. We will have a very short introduction towards what are injectables and later on we will emphasize on the various types of injectables like your solutions, microparticles, reseal erythrocytes and the colloidal dispersions and finally reaching to the summary and conclusions. What is parenteral control drug delivery? The term parenteral refers to the injectable routes of administration. It is derived from the Greek words para which is outside and enteron which relates to the intestine. So it denotes the route of administrations which are other than the interon or other than the oral route. The parental preparations are absolutely sterile, pyrogen free and probably these preparations are intended to be in directly contact with the blood or the blood or the body mucosa. The parental administration route is the most effective and common form of delivery for active drug substances with poor bioavailability and the drugs which are primarily having a very narrow therapeutic index. Let us start to understand that what are the various types of parental control drug delivery systems. In order to understand them individually, we can classify them as injectable drug delivery systems, implantable drug delivery systems and infusion devices. Beginning with the very first one, that is the injectable drug delivery systems. These are one classical examples of the development and manufacturing of the various pharmaceutical preparations and it has been a very fine example of customer oriented conversion into a high quality medical and pharmaceutical product. The injectable delivery of a drug at the target site is one of the main themes in controlled drug delivery systems which can release drugs for more than one week. The extended release of drug can be attained by either non-biodegradable or biodegradable systems. The next one is the implantable drug delivery system. These systems are practically placed completely under the skin, usually in a convenient but inconspicuous location. The next type is infusion devices. Infusion devices accurately regulate the amount of intravenous solutions containing drugs administered to the patients. In the subsequent portion of the presentation, we would discuss the various aspects of long-acting injectable drug delivery systems. My dear students, let us just start to highlight the various advantages of the long-term injectable systems. The first advantage which comes at the foresight is the predetermined profile of drug release during a period of time which allows a better, better patient compliance. The second one probably is something which we can relate to is being easiness of use or ease of application. Then a major advantage of such a system is the improved bioavailability by avoidance of the first pass metabolism. I think being pharmaceutical students, we are very, very sure of the point that most of the biggest problem through the oral route of administration is with drugs which are susceptible to high first pass metabolism. Because of just they are reaching the liver which is probably the primary site for metabolism, the drug which is being given in a particular dose goes to the liver and because it is susceptible to the metabolism is then available in a very very low amount which probably leads to a very poor bioavailability. Now the question comes that can we 
increases by availability, the first prompt answer is that we can probably go in for an injectable system through which we can definitely increase or enhance the bioavailability. The next advantage which probably is associated with this long acting injectables are that by virtue of the word long acting injectable we can understand that it will definitely lead to reduced dosing frequency. That means we will have fewer injections and without compromising the effectiveness of the treatment. The next advantage which comes to our mind is the decreased incidence of side effects. It is directly related to the frequency of administration. Because an individual is being given less number of injections, therefore the load of the side effects is drastically reduced. And because finally a big advantage which comes to our mind is its affordability. When I say affordability, it simply means by virtue of having a reduced medical uh, treatment uh, cost, we can probably have a better affordable medical care. On your screens, you can probably see the various types of injectable drug delivery systems which are available. We can have them in the form of solutions. We can probably design them into microparticles which can then be suspended into the liquid or the solvent and then injected subsequently. We can have a very classy type of system which consists of the resealed erythrocytes which are loaded with the drug and the API or any specific moiety. Then we can have a large variety of colloidal systems which can be given in the form of dispersions. The first approach for getting a controlled release parenteral formulation is to try the simplest mechanism of making a formulation which is a basic solution. Parent solutions for injection into the blood may be either buffered or non-buffered. We can have both ways like we can have a solution which is aqueous so also we can have an oil solution and both of them can be very appropriately tweaked to deliver a control drug release. Beginning with the first mechanism where we are using an aqueous solution, the drug release from the aqueous solution is controlled basically in three ways. The first one is by increasing the viscosity of the vehicle. This is very clearly done by using the viscosifiers or viscosity enhancing polymers which may include examples like carboxymethyl cellulose methyl cellulose and polyvinyl pyrrolidone. This enhancement in the viscosity decreases its molecular diffusion and hence help in localizing the injected drug. The second approach is by forming a complex with macromolecules from which the drug dissociates at a controlled rate. In this case, after dissociation, the release of the needed drug is there and only the free drug gets absorbed. The third mechanism which we can talk about is the formation or decreasing the solubility of the parent drug. This is appropriately done by forming complexes with the polymers in which the controlled drug release is not achieved by dissociation but by reducing the solubility of the parent drug. A very typical example is protamine zinc insulin and cyanocobalamin zinc tannate. The next approach in order to get a controlled drug delivery through the parenteral route is by using the oil solutions. This formulation releases the drug by partitioning the drug to oil with surrounding aqueous biological fluids. In order to try to understand how this release is possible, let us say K is equal to the drug concentration in the oil by the concentration of drug in the aqueous phase. That is, the partitioning of the drug can be appropriately uh, shown by the equation K is equal to D naught by DW, where the DO is the drug concentration in oil and while the DW is a drug concentration in the aqueous phase. 
the total amount of the drug dt in the oil system at any time can be expressed logically as dt is equal to dw into kv0 plus vw the fraction of the drug which is present in the aqueous phase which is available for absorption can be given by f equates to 1 by k alpha plus 1 where alpha is equal to v0 by vw when we talk about the, of the oil based solutions we probably have to look forward to the source of this particular oil mostly vegetables oils are used for development of parenteral oil solutions and which oils primarily something like the cottonseed oil arrakis oil are very well suited for this purpose the method is valid only for those drugs which are oil soluble. I think it is very well understandable that when I use the word solution, it primarily means that the solute has to be absolutely soluble in the chosen solvent. So the restriction in this case would be that only those drugs which are oil soluble and have an optimum partition coefficient are suitable for the usage as the oil soluble solutions for parenteral administration. The oil based injectable formulations are usually either oil suspensions or the oil solutions. The long acting injections include either the lipophilic drugs suspended in an aqueous solvent, so you have an aqueous solvent or a in the then it is getting suspended so it becomes a suspension or a lipophilic drug which is dissolved in the vegetable oil in first case i have an aqueous drug which is then suspended into a oily base and probably the end product would be referred to as an oil based injectable suspension in the other case, my drug primarily is highly lipophilic and I probably very successfully incorporate this into a vegetable oil solvent. And then the injection which I will get would be an oil is soluble injection or the oil based injection. The administration of these long acting formulations take place only for a few weeks. In the suspension formulations, the rate limiting step of the drug absorption is the dissolution of the drug particles in the formulation or in the tissue fluid surrounding the drug formulation. Poorly water soluble salts can be used to control the dissolution rate of drug particles to prolong the absorption. A very typical example is your olanzapine pamoate which is given in conditions like of mental disorders and it is an example of a poorly water soluble salt form of lansapine. So these can be very well incorporated into a long lasting injectable formulations and is very well suited for usage for prolonged release. Microparticles. After the solutions both in aqueous and oily phases we have another important means by which we can be ensured of a controlled drug delivery through a parenteral route and this is the usage of microparticles which can then be suspended using the suitable water for injection or any other suitable parenteral liquid and then injected at the site of action or at the desired site. Let us first try to understand what are microparticles. Microparticles primarily can be categorized as microspheres and microcapsules. They have a particle size which ranges between 0.2 to 5 micrometers. They are free flowing powders, spherical in shape and can be suspended as just suggested in a suitable aqueous vehicle and injected by an 18 or 20 number of suitable needle. In microspheres, the drug particles are basically dispersed in polymer matrix from which the drug is released by a first order process at an extended period of time. In case of microcapsules, the drug is centrally located in the polymeric shell of finite thickness and release may be controlled by dissolution and diffusion 
or both with a zero order rate kinetics. They were initially developed as carriers for vaccines and anti-cancer drugs. The properties of microparticles includes increased efficiency of drug delivery, improved release profile, and drug targeting at a particular site. Several investigations have focused on the development and delivery of microparticles to reduce their uptake by the reticuloendothelial system and improve their uptake by the targeted cells. Many functional surface coatings of non-biodegradable carboxylated polystyrene or biodegradable poly lactide co-glycolide, poly G, polyethylene glycol were investigated in attempts to shield them from non-specific phagocytosis and to allow ligand-specific interactions via molecular recognition. It was found that coatings of PLLGs, PEG ligand conjugates provided specific targeting of microspheres to human blood-derived macrophages and dendritic cells while reducing the non-specific phagocytosis. Microparticles can also be used to facilitate non-traditional routes of drug administration. For example, it was found that microparticles improved immunization with the help of the mucosal route of administration of therapeutics. They can be very well translocated to tissues of the immune system and aggravate immunological reactions. Biodegradable microparticles can be used for targeted delivery of drugs in addition to the sustained release applications. When given intravenously, the drug-loaded particles can lead to arterial chemoembolization and deliver drugs at the desired site. The microparticles are administered as an aqueous suspension subcutaneously or intramuscularly for systemic delivery or they may be injected into a specific location in the body. Methods of preparation of microparticles Of course, this is a very specialized drug delivery system where we first prepare the microparticles in a manner that they qualify to be either called as microspheres or microcapsules. These are then prepared, lyophilized, dried in the dried powder form and finally to be injected into the desired site of action. We have many techniques which can be used for development of microparticles. Some of them which are of common usage include number one, the coacervation phase separation technique, number two, the emulsion phase separation technique, third is referred to as the solvent evaporation method and the fourth one is the spray drying method. Let us first discuss about the coacervation phase separation technique. This technique is very well suited for microencapsulation of water-soluble drugs. The core material, that is the drug, is suspended in a non-aqueous polymer solution, which is primarily the coating material. The polymer is uniformly coated by various approaches, such as temperature change, addition of an incompatible polymer, addition of non-solvent or addition of a salt. The next method is referred to as the emulsion phase separation method. This technique is again very suited for water-soluble drugs. In this method, an aqueous phase containing dissolved drug and an organic phase containing polymer are basically emulsified. Then the polymer phase is separated using the techniques such as the addition of salts, 
temperature change, etc. The non-solvent is then used to hard the microspheres or harden the microspheres. On your screens, my dear students, you can just simply say a schema of making an emulsion phase separation based microspheres. You have in two beakers the drug solution and the polymer solution, which is homogenized, emulsified, and you get a drug dispersed in a polymer solution. Then you can rely on in any of the methods like the addition of non solvent salt addition or change in pH methodology to obtain the microspheres. These are then transferred into the hardening agent which is basically a non-solvent and results in giving the rigidity to the walls of the microspheres which have been prepared. They can then be submitted for final drying and packaging per se. Solvent evaporation this technique is most commonly used for the formation of microparticles of the drugs that are soluble or suspended in the organic phase. In this method, a solution or suspension of the drug in an organic solvent containing dissolved polymer is emulsified to get a oil in water or an oil in oil dispersion with or without the aid of a suitable surfactant. The organic phase is then evaporated by heating or by applying a vacuum while heating. My dear students, in front of your screens, you can see two separate beakers, one having the drug solution, the other the polymer in the organic solvent. This polymer in organic solvent is added drop-wise to the aqueous solution which is also containing suitable quantities of surfactant. The process of emulsification results into an emulsion. The solvent is evaporated. What we get in this beaker is a microparticle suspension, which can very easily be separated by the process of centrifugation. The final product which is obtained is submitted for lyophilization and it is obtained in the form of the microparticles. We have another method which is referred to as the spray drying technology. It is an ideal method for preparation of microparticles of poorly water soluble drugs. The drug is dispersed in a polymer or a coating solution. The process can be taken into consideration having three stages. In the first stage, the formulation which is primarily a dispersion, a suspension or an emulsion is taken and it is atomized into an air stream. The air is usually heated which supplies the latent heat of vaporization required to remove the solvent and form the microencapsulated product. The stage 2 of the method primarily is taking care of the droplet drying. And in the stage 3, the product is separated and collected by using a cyclone arrangement. My dear students, one of the very innovative system which was devised mm. in order to give a prolonged action and that through, through the parenteral route mm. was the advent of something which we relate to as a resealed erythrocytes. The word erythrocytes of course means that we are talking about the red blood carpuscles. When I use the word reseal erythrocytes, it would be something related to the lysing of the erythrocytes and then probably doing something and then resealing them. When I sum up the advantages or the attributes of the reseal erythrocytes, we can probably look forward to its being a biodegradable, biocompatible, non-immunogenic. These are prepared by collecting blood samples from the organism of interest. Then followed by separating the erythrocytes from the plasma. Later on entrapping the drug in the lysed erythrocytes by the various methods which are available. And finally resealing the resultant cellular carriers. Now 
what happens once these cellular carriers are resealed these can circulate intravascularly for days and allow large number of drugs to be carried the drugs which can be very very commonly encapsulated include the enzymes amino acids carbohydrates nucleotides and human factor and these can be very well encapsulated by this system called as a resealed erythrocytes this is a very complex and a unique methodology before we get into the details of this method the first thing we should understand is that what is the source of these erythrocytes or the red blood cells let us highlight the source and isolation of erythrocytes various types of mammalian erythrocytes have been used for drug delivery which includes erythrocytes of mice cattle goats monkeys pigs dogs sheep chicken rats and rabbits how is it isolated fresh blood is collected from mammalian and stored at 4 degree centigrade for less than 2 days the erythrocytes are then collected by centrifugation and washed the washed erythrocyte cells are then suspended in buffer solutions at various hematocrit values as desired and are often stored in acid citrate dextrose buffer at 4 degree centigrade for 48 hours before their usage the fresh blood is mostly used for loading purposes because it yields higher encapsulation efficiency as compared to the old blood there are several methods which can be used to load drugs or other bioactive compounds in erythrocytes drug loading is definitely a big challenge the first method which has been very commonly used is the hypotonic hemolysis method in this the red cells are placed in a hypotonic drug solutions because of the sheer difference in the tonicity there is a lysis of cell and the entry of drug happens into these red blood cells after a stipulated time period the resealed red cells are loaded with drug the second method is the chemical perturbation of the membrane this technique is basically based on the increase in membrane permeability of erythrocytes when the cells are exposed to certain chemicals this exposure leads to invariably high permeability and the drug finds its path into the erythrocyte membranes leads to high drug encapsulation and finally is probably ready to deliver larger quantities of drug the next method is the isotonic osmotic lysis method this method is also known as the osmotic pulse method it involves isotonic hemolysis that is attained by physical or chemical means the isotonic solutions may or may not be of the same tone or the same osmolarity if erythrocytes are incubated in solutions of a substance with high membrane permeability the solute will diffuse into the cells because of the sheer concentration gradient difference this process is followed by an influx of water to maintain the osmotic equilibrium the last method is referred to as loading by electric cell fusion this method involves the initial loading of drug molecules into erythrocyte ghosts followed by adhesion of these cells to the target cells the fusion is accentuated by the application of an electric pulse which leads to the release of the entrapped molecule resealed erythrocytes 
have numerous possible applications in various fields of human and veterinary medicines. Such cells could be used as circulating carriers to distribute a drug within a prolonged period of time in circulation or at the target specific organs which might include liver, spleen and lymph nodes. A majority of the drug delivery studies using drug-loaded erythrocytes are definitely in the preclinical phase. The next means of delivering a controlled drug delivery through the parenteral route is the use of colloidal dispersions. The term colloids basically implies, as per the Greek definition, that it is a glue-like substance. The colloidal dispersions containing the drug particles are dispersed in an aqueous vehicle in which the diameter of the suspended particle is almost less than 1 mm. There can be a large number and types of colloidal dispersion systems like liposomes, neosomes, nanosuspensions, nanoemulsions and missile formations. Uh, as we have just mentioned, the various colloidal dispersion systems, one of the prominent amongst these is that which is referred to as the liposomes. The liposomes consist of an outer uni or multilaminar membrane and an inner liquid core. We can probably understand this as a core which is probably having a liquid inside it and then if we are having a single layer, we call it as a uni lamellar and if it is having more than one layer then we refer to it as the multilamellar. If I just go a little deep then liposomes can primarily be referred to as are, are designated as large unilamellar vesicles and small unilamellar vesicles. The name large and small or the word large and small probably clarifies that although it is unilamellar but it has got a little larger size whereas simply being unilamellar and a small size makes it an SUV. Then we also have a designated acronym MLV which is referred to as your multilamellar vesicles. So in conclusion we can have large unilamellar vesicles, small unilamellar vesicles and multilamellar vesicles. The phospholipids which compose the liposomes are amphipathic, possessing both a hydrophilic polar head and a hydrophobic non-polar tail. They can be administered topically, parenterally by, also by inhalation and possibly by other routes of administration. But under this module, we probably would focus its usage and exploitation when it is used as a parenteral uh, drug delivery. In most cases, the liposomes are made with the natural or synthetic phospholipids that are similar to those in the cellular plasma membrane. This is probably one of the major advantages as well, that because it is something very similar to the biological membrane components, therefore the acceptability is much much higher and therefore the liposomes are easily utilized by the body cells. Liposomes can be loaded with drugs in by two principal ways or in two principal manners. The first one is the lipophilic compounds can be associated with the liposible membrane itself. The other principle is if the drug is hydrophilic in nature it can be dissolved in the inner liquid core of the liposomes. To decrease their uptake by the cells of the reticuloendothelial system and for targeting the membrane of liposomes it can be modified by the polymeric chains and or targeting moieties or antibodies specific to the targeted cells. These are relatively easy to prepare, are usually biodegradable and non-toxic. Liposomes per se have enormous applications as drug delivery systems. On your screens, you can see a typical structure of liposome. 
where you can see the phospholipid molecules which are arranged in a lamellar ways. It can be a multiple lamellar structure or it can be a unilamellar structure. The drug's particle, depending upon its solubility, will get associated either with the liposomal membrane or will have to be dissolved in the inner liquid core of the liposomes. The next in line is the system which is referred to as the neosomes. Neosomes are peculiarly non-ionic surfactant vesicles. These are obtained by hydration of synthetic non-ionic surfactants with or without incorporation of cholesterol or other lipids. They are vesicular systems similar to liposomes that can be used as carriers for amphiphilic and lipophilic drugs. These are promising vehicles for drug delivery and are non-ionic, less toxic and therefore help in improving the therapeutic index of the drug by restricting its action only to the target cells. The major components of neosomes are non-ionic surfactants which gives it an advantage of being more stable when compared to liposomes which suffers from certain specific disadvantages. The liposomes are susceptible to oxidation and of course are probably having a huge influence of size shape and sometimes the stability is compromised. Coming to the specific attributes of the neosomes, the two main components which are utilized for the formulation of neosomes include number one, the non-ionic surfactants which can be exemplified by a variety of spans and twins. We have span 20 through span 85 and twin 20 through twin 80. Then we can have cholesterol, which is primarily used in neosomal preparations to provide the rigidity, proper shape and conformation to the final product of neosomes. It definitely endows it with the stability of vesicles. The diagram in front of your screens primarily specifies the areas which are peculiarly hydrophilic domain which will have in its proximity the hydrophilic drug then it will have a very defined surfactant bilayer and then we finally have the rigidization layer which is primarily hydrophobic domain. So in a nutshell, we can specify that a neosome will have a defined hydrophilic domain, a defined hydrophobic domain as well. My dear students, it is very important to understand and appreciate that the advent of nanotechnology and its collaboration with the drug delivery system sciences mm -hmm. has actually yielded an armamentarium of variety of nano drug delivery systems. They are amenable to oral delivery, amenable to topical delivery, can be very well used through any other route as well. One of the systems which primarily is very well suited for the delivery through the parenteral route is the nano suspension. It is primarily a submicron colloidal dispersion of drug particles in an aqueous vehicle which can be very suitably used for the parenteral administration. The particle size has to be in the nanometric range, so the wide range which can be acceptable is between 1 to 1000 nanometers. The nano suspensions differs from nanoparticles as the nanoparticles are polymeric colloidal carriers of drugs whereas nano suspensions are colloidal dispersions of drug in an aqueous solvent.
to understand the nanoparticle we can appreciate that there can be a encapsulating agent or a polymer which is having the drug inside it whereas in case of the nano suspension the drug per se is not interacting or being encapsulated in a polymer rather it is in the naked or the neat form but reduced drastically in a range of 1 to 1000 nanometers the nano suspension is prepared by reducing the particle size and maintaining a perfect crystalline state of the particles to stabilize the formulation. One of the major challenges in case of the nano suspensions is that once they are being reduced to a particular size, they tend to get together. And because of this coming together or because of this phenomena called as Ostwald ripening, it has got a lot of stability issues. We are able to appreciate that nano suspensions will be very highly suitable for enhancing the bioavailability of a drug. The reasons are simple. When a particle size is reduced, the surface area is increasing and when the surface area increasing, it will have a better dissolution and finally resulting into the better absorption and hence an enhanced bioavailability. Class 2 drugs or any drugs which have poor solubility are highly amenable to be converted into nano suspensions. The next system probably on the same premise of using the nanotechnology are your nano emulsion systems. As just mentioned, like the nano suspensions, they are also suitable for delivery through other routes as well, like the oral route, the topical route, and of course is very suited for the parental route. We can simply define it as a biphasic heterogeneous system, which is composed of two immiscible liquids, that is water and oil. And this water and oil probably, depending on which one is the dispersed phase and which one is the dispersion phase, it can be categorized as to oil in water and water in oil type. Needless to say that the stability will be an issue. It is to be converted into thermodynamically stable system. Therefore, there would be a lot of challenges in choosing the right emulsifying agents. The mean droplet diameter ranges from 50 to 1000 nanometers. The average droplet size usually is between 100 to 500 nanometers. And as I just mentioned, can either be existing in an oil in water or a water in oil system with suitable use of emulsifying agents. They can be prepared by two, way, two methods. One is referred to as your high energy methods, which probably is making use of high pressure homogenizer or ultrasound generator. The name in itself or the group of words in itself clarifies that that there would be a usage of high pressure and the energy level would be much, much higher, which will be put to use. In case of the low energy methods, which is the second probable method for formulation of nano emulsions, it probably would lead to self emulsification is one method and phase inversion is the other method. Most commonly used oil phases are natural or synthetic lipids, fatty acids, oils such as medium or long chain triglycerides or perfluorochemicals. Emulsifiers and co-emulsifiers. The selection of these two group of emulsifying agents probably lead to the best outcomes as a nano emulsion drug delivery system. They can be natural or modified lecithin, polyethylene oxide containing block copolymers, PEG, conjugated castor oil derivatives, which are referred to as your cremophore EL, then glycerides and positively charged lipids. The other pharmaceutical additives, which would probably be optimized, would be the categories like pH adjusting agents. Some of them would also require the antioxidants. Then probably if it had to be an oral, which probably is not, in, not a concern at this point of time, it would might need flavors. And of course, it would also need a certain amount of preservatives. We will now try to discuss and understand the missiles which are used as the carrier systems for control delivery through the parental route. The missiles are 
self-assembling colloidal systems with a particle size ranging from 5 to 100 nanometers. It contains lipid molecules that arrange themselves in a spherical form in an aqueous solutions. The formation of a muscle is a response to the amphipathic nature of the fatty acids. That is, they contain both hydrophilic regions, that is the polar head groups, as well as hydrophobic regions that are the long hydrophobic chains. As the surfactant concentration is increased, the separated molecules aggregate into micelles upon reaching the critical micelle concentration. We have a variety of micelle forming amphiphilic copolymers, which include the block copolymers, which could be di, tri, tetra, or poly variety. And we have got specific graft copolymers like ethylene glycol B poly, epsilon caprolacton co poly dioxanon, or MPEG PCL co PDO copolymers. A graft copolymer is one which comprises a polymer chain as a backbone and another polymer chain as side grafted parts. We had a typical example of doxorubucin and gemcitabine which were chemically linked to biodegradable polymers to prepare polymer doxorubucin and polymer gemcitabine conjugates. Moreover, the two conjugates can self-assemble into missiles with both doxorubucin and gemcitabine in the same mixed missiles. You can see on your screen the polymeric chain which is MPEG PLA dox and MPEG PLA gem. They have got the property of self-emulsifying and after self-emulsification you can see the presence of both the drug doxorubicin and gemcitabine and such a muscle which is carrying this both variety of drugs can be called as the mixed muscles. My dear students, we finally have reached to the end of the, uh, towards the end of this module. In this module, we probably learned a few very important points pertaining to the parental control drug delivery system. We will very quickly try to recapitulate each one of them. The first is we try to define what is a parental control drug delivery system and we appreciated that it could be divided into injectable drug delivery system, implantable drug delivery system and can also have the infusion devices. We spent more time on understanding the injectable drug delivery systems and probably classified them into something which consists of the solution microparticles, reseal erythrocytes, and the colloidal dispersion systems. The parental solutions for injections are buffered or non-buffered solutions, wherein the drug delivery can be controlled by three ways, like by increasing the viscosity of the vehicle, by forming a complex with the macromolecule, and by decreasing the solubility of the parent drug. The next take home message about them is that they could be either aqueous or oily solutions. Then we emphasized upon understanding regarding the microparticles which we classified and understood to be as free flowing powders, spherical in shape, having a particle size between 0.2 to 2 micrometers. We also appreciated the various advantages associated with microparticles like it would give us an improved release profile, it will give us drug targeting, reduced uptake by the reticuloendothelial system would be another advantage. Later on, as we went ahead, we were able to appreciate the various techniques which we can explore for the synthesis and manufacturing of microparticles. They included the coacervation phase separation, the emulsion phase separation, the solvent evaporation technique and a very fine, very suitable for scale up that is a spray drying technique. The latter part of the presentation highlighted the use of resealed erythrocytes. 
we could appreciate that these are biocompatible carriers widely studied for their ability to carry and deliver various drugs. Then towards the end of the presentation, we had a synopsis on colloidal dispersions and the drug particles in which can be, which can be dispersed in an aqueous vehicle and the diameter of such suspended particles is restricted to less than 1 mm in size. We had different systems which could fall under this category which included liposomes, neosomes, nanosuspensions, nanoemulsions and micellar systems. We tried to emphasize on understand the salient features of each one of them. The final conclusion is that we have got a variety of parent rule formulations which can be used and there are many types of innovations which are being continuously done in order to get systems which can act for long durations.